I'm John Riley, and I'm going to be reading from my book, El Spine, today. I picked out a story that I think you're going to like. It's called In the Stacks. The library at Amoskeague University sits just on the edge of campus, nestled up against Mount Borges, where a towering letter A crowns the summit. The original structure where the library stands predated the founding of the new university and had been donated by the coal baron Silas Potts as a memorial to his son who died in a mining disaster 20 years earlier. Mining had been the lifeblood of the town and the explosion deep in the mine had ripped its heart out when it killed 17 of its fathers and sons. The elder Potts had been on the scene for days, waiting to hear news from below. He refused to sleep and directed rescue crews for the two nights it took to reach the men trapped below. When the mine elevator finally rose to the surface, to the glaring anticipation of the families above, there stood only a boot. All that was sent up from below was a boot. A boot with a foot still in it. After that day, Mr. Potts was never seen around the mine again. He dedicated himself to amassing a collection of books on the afterlife and spent a fortune building shelving and digging into the mountain for more and more stacks. He, con he consulted psychics on how to build the library, and he traveled to Lilydale in New York each summer to consult with that village full of psychics. They told him that if he kept building the library, his son would eventually cross over and speak to him there. When Silas Potts died, the library became the cornerstone of the university. The rich veins of coal were exhausted, and the town had the feeling of a ghost town. Everyone hoped that the university would breathe new life into the area. I came to school there just as it opened. I was attracted to the courses in the history of the cult based on the extensive library that Potts had amassed. The George Potts Library opened to the public on the same day the university opened. I went along with the rest of the throng to see just what Potts had amassed in all those years. At the reference desk, a dark-haired librarian told me that not all of the stacks were open yet. In fact, the librarians hadn't even found the end of the collection. I laughed when she told me that and assumed that she only meant that they hadn't had a chance to catalog everything yet. I'd always known librarians for whom cataloging one book a day was considered a full day's work. Meticulous cataloging was dying out about this time, though, and automated cataloging should have allowed the librarians to speed things up a bit. Maybe the books were just too obscure. Anyway, I pushed ahead, past the crowd that was grazing on white wine and cheese in the atrium, and I bounded down the marble staircase to the first of several subterranean floors. There wasn't any map on the wall, so I set out to just wander and see what was there. The buzzing of the crowd faded behind me as I walked down the empty hall. I must have been walking for a good 15 minutes and still hadn't reached a wall, just tightly packed shelves of uncatalogued books. Signs at the end of each stack advised me to turn off the lights as I passed by to save on the energy bill, so I traveled in a pool of light surrounded by darkness. Up ahead, I could see someone coming toward me carrying a stack of catalog cards. She identified herself as one of the librarians. She had worked for Mr. Potts and now was employed by the university. She was carrying a lunch pail. She told me that she needed it because it took so long to reach her work area, many rooms ahead, and that she actually had to stop for lunch on the way. Others in her work area, she explained, never left and spent days voyaging deeper into the stacks, trying to find the end. Some had been there for years, and they had mounted expeditions with pack animals and weeks worth of supplies. Some had never returned. She had a slightly demented look and was prematurely gray. The lack of sunshine had left her skin a sallow white. She must be out of her mind, too, <laughs> to believe any story that wild. I was happy to leave her behind as she worked her way back up to the entrance, and I pressed on deeper into the stacks. I was starting to feel a little hungry, too, but I could eat later. I remember that as a child, I, I would skip lunch so I'd have money to buy books. The hunger would pass, but I would get my book. I decided to pick up the pace a bit in order to get home by dinner, so I started a steady trot, pausing to switch lights on every fourth shelf. But I skipped turning them off behind me. There just wasn't enough time anymore. The books in the stacks became a blur as I rushed forward. I saw a light ahead. I must be reaching the end of the hall. As I approached, the librarian on a bicycle with a headlamp rode toward me. When I stopped him, he barely had time to speak. He too looked prematurely old for such a boyish face. His bicycle appeared to be the type I had seen as a child, big balloon tires and ornate chrome. He looked almost new. 
As he rode off, I called after him. Where's the end of this corridor? He just shouted something back about, get your own damn bicycle. Which I did, about ten minutes later, when I found a bike leaning against the stacks. Now I could make some time. I was surviving on food that had been left behind by those who had gone ahead of me. Scraps of sandwiches, stale crackers in the bottom of cast-off boxes. At the beginning of the library, up above in the first rows of the stacks, the books were of a scientific bin. Monographs on psychology, medicine, mine engineering, and so forth. But as I went further into the stacks, the books veered off into parapsychology, spiritism, and finally into the occult, Kabbalah, and mysticism. These were the books Potts had added toward the ends of his life. <clears throat> I couldn't stop to turn on the lights anymore, <clears throat> but the headlamp poked a sharp ray of light into the tunnel ahead. After a while, the floor changed from marble to rougher stone, and finally into a short-gauge railroad, railroad track. It was here that the building gave way to the abandoned mine shafts, but the books continued on uninterrupted. I had abandoned the bicycle, and I was back on foot. I detached the headlamp and proceeded on past empty cans and bottles scattered around the floor. Potts must have thought that by building his library deep into the earth, he would someday reach the site of the disaster and there be able to talk with his son, as the psychics had predicted. I would keep going until I found the spot myself. Obviously, Potts had been there once. I would go there too. After what seemed like days, I came to a fork in the tunnel. Which way to go? To the right? I could just make out a low humming noise, so I went that way. After several minutes, I came to a room where a refrigerator stood empty and cans littered the floor. A dusty map on the table showed a network of tunnels and a date somewhere in the future. Was this the planned date for reaching that point, or had I been traveling for years? I heard a voice from across the wall. When I went over, a man on crutches stood before me. He had one leg blown off below the knee. Behind him stood sixteen others, digging deeper into the earth. I was astounded to see that before me stood the young Potts, not aged, not quite alive, as he was nearly transparent. The other men appeared as he did, as if never having aged, but all were severely wounded. Some were missing arms, others legs, and one man was even missing his head. Had I too crossed over? Had Potts found the accident site and reconnoitered with his dead son? Had the psychics been right? Had Potts found just the book needed to direct him there? My mind was reeling from seeing the dead men in front of me, but when I regained the modicum of sanity, I was sent reeling again. The men were pulling books from the dirt with their picks and shovels. Some were shaking them clean, and others were loading them into small coal carts for transport into the stacks. They were pulling whole shelves of books from what appeared to be seams in the earth, like coal seams. There were bands of books stretching into the dark mine shafts. How far and how deep did these layers of books go? Could they stretch into the center of the earth? I had become as totally deranged as all of the librarians. I began to claw at the dark earth with a pick like the other man. I began pulling out books in Hebrew script. All the books in the shop were in Hebrew. I noticed that there was no lighting in the shop and that all of the illumination came directly from the books themselves. Bright, pulsing letters danced on the covers and from within the sheets. The books were warm to the touch and gave off a pleasant odor of incense. As I held one of the volumes, I could feel a power surging through my arms and into my chest. I was, it was just such a power that was, must have brought the miners back to life. It was a pleasant, all-encompassing surge that was about to knock me over. I could feel the letters themselves now pulsating against my hands as they sent rays of light out into the darkness. I watched the letters emanate from the book as they took forms of rocks and earth. The book itself was undiminished, but bright minerals and dark earth were appearing all around in an unending flow. I had found the pulsing center of creation that the Sefer Yetzira had spoken of, where the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and 10 numerals were the building blocks of the universe. From them radiated all creation. Here at the end of the library, creation was a living force, bringing light and knowledge in an unending flow from the center of the planet. As I ran to retrace my steps and tell the world, all I could think was, how the hell are the catalogers going to be able to keep up with this?